Welcome to the Iyun Podcast, an in-depth look at Haredi society, Israel, and the Jewish people. I am your host, Ari Koretsky, and I invite you to join us as we confront the challenges, joys, and possibilities of Torah-centered living in an evolving world. The Iyun Podcast. Think again. Welcome back, friends, to the Iyun Podcast. If I say the phrase, Haredi Hesder, you likely would do a double take and wonder if I misspoke because Haredi and Hesder are typically viewed as an oxymoron. Hesder framework, of course, famously associated with what we know as the Dati Lumi, the religious Zionist community. But in fact, to Rabbi Carmi Gross, the phrase is not an oxymoron and in fact is a reality that he has incepted, brought into existence and which we will learn all about on this episode. Meanwhile, I just want to thank everyone for all of the wonderful feedback we've gotten so far as we've began this podcast just a few episodes ago. And believe me, we're just getting started, but we're really heartened. Myself, Rabbi Yoshua Pfeffer of the Eon Institute, and all of those involved in this project are really, really grateful for the wonderful feedback. And in response to some of those queries, rest assured that while we certainly will continue the army topic, that conversation has quite a few more legs, in my opinion. We will certainly also be branching out to other fascinating topics of interest as they relate to Haredi and Haredi adjacent communities in Eretz Yisrael and around the world, including the workforce, women in the community, demographic issues, and much, much more. So please stay tuned, both for our mini series on the army, but beyond that as well in the weeks and months ahead. And now, my conversation with the founder of Haredi Hezder, Rabbi Carmi Gross. And we are here with Rabbi Carmi Gross, the founder and Rosh Hashiva of Beit Midrash Derech Chaim, a Haredi Hezder program, and we'll kind of break down all of those terms. But first, how are you, uh, Rabbi Carmi? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank you for having me here this morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, very briefly, tell us a little bit about your own history, your own background. You will hear the, uh, the distinctly American accent, so obviously uh, not a native Israeli, but uh, where did it all uh, begin? Uh, born and raised in Miami Beach, Florida. Came to Eretz Yisrael basically in 1973 after finishing high school. Came with uh, my family for Shabbaton. I was in yeshiva in Israel for my uh, year. I learned in Beis Talmud. After that, I continued on in uh, yeshivas, in, uh, sometimes in Eretz Yisrael, sometimes in America. I was in uh, the yeshiva in Miami Beach. Rabbi Zweig. Rabbi Zweig's yeshiva. My father, Vashalom, actually brought Rabbi Zweig to Miami to be the Rosh Yeshiva. He was my Rebbe, actually, in 73 in Eretz Yisrael, in Beis HaTalmud. Unbelievable. By the way, is, okay. it, is uh, any relation to Rabbi Gross from the Hebrew Academy? Is that... Uh... Yeah, a little bit. It's my father. <laughs> That's your yes. father. Yes. I just met uh, recently somebody, a grandson, maybe, somebody that's uh, actually named after him, I think, Sender Gross, possibly. Is that yes, possible? yes, there are a number, yes. I met one, I don't even remember where, but it was in the last week or two, so it's just a fresh in my mind. Uh, very cool. Okay, it's Small amazing. World. Really, indeed. So you've had some prominent alumni. I know Ron Dermer went there, yes, the uh, American yes. ambassador, and now BB's uh, uh, big uh, advisor. But yes. uh, yeah, okay, wonderful. So you grew up in Miami, and you were here in 73, did that... I imagine you were here for the Yom Kippur War. We were here for the Yom Kippur War. I actually started the year out in Gush Etzion, in the yeshiva there. That's where I started. I, um, so I was there during Yom Kippur. I was davening there in Yom Kippur when many of the boys, uh, almost all the boys, left the yeshiva in the middle of the, in the, middle of the davening. Um, but I didn't stay there after. I, I left there, and then I went to Beis Talmud. That's quite a uh, dramatic change in terms of the Hashkava. Yeah, you know, for Americans, we don't really play that game. You know, there wasn't really a big difference whether you were kippah suga or black kippah. Didn't, you know, Americans didn't really get into that too much, certainly not in Miami Beach. Right, and I guess in the early 70s, the uh, distinctions were a little bit less uh, stark or less uh, polarized. Yes, I, I really believe you have it today also. You have many American boys who can come from you know, the American day school, high schools, yeshiva high schools, and they could land up in Gush, or they could land up in, in uh, Shiva Takotel, or they could land up by, you know, in a Haredi place. More, you know, it's, it's not really a, the, the distinctions that we make here in Israel. They, 
for lack of a better term, the black and white. It's, it's more metushtash, as they say. I guess a little more the watered or a little muddied. Or we don't make such such clear distinctions. So I, I didn't see it as a big change at all. Now, did the seventy three ward, the Yom Kippur ward, did that leave a, an imprint on you? What what kind of um, effect did that have? Uh, not really, not really. I was an American teenager, you know, pretty clueless. Um, I mean, it was special. I remember going around and 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 uh, being with Nadev. We were we actually volunteered to many different places. And, uh, you know, it, uh, but like I said, it, it, you, I wasn't really into the Israeli culture. As, as most Americans that come to Eretz Yisrael for the year, you're sort of on the outside looking in. So the, the uh, you know, the, uh, what went on re- really wasn't that, uh, as you say, life-altering or anything. So how did you end up in Eretz Yisrael as a long-term uh, you know, life uh, that, project. <laughs> that, that's a good question. I basically started out in, you know, being in, in uh, Miami and then coming to Eretz Yisrael, where we, we were always from a family that was very strongly at Sioni, and um, came to Eretz Yisrael, and I, I fell in love with Eretz Yisrael. Fell in love with it almost right away. As a, as a, as a bacher? As a bacher, as an 18-year-old, and my plan always was to come back. And even after that year in Israel, I went back and actually helped found the Yeshiva Miami. Rav Reuchen, who was my Rebbe then in Eretz Yisrael, came and opened the Yeshiva Miami. And I was there for two years, and then I was in Lakewood for, for a couple of, I think, two years also. Under Rav Schneer. Under Rav Schneer was there, yes. I was actually very close with Rav Schneer. I dormed actually in a place, in a house that was right next to his house, and we used to walk every morning to, to the Yeshiva together. It was very special. I, I, I was able to have a, a real relationship with him, speak to him about things, he even spoke about times when he was in Eretz Yisrael. I remember um, he talked about being in Eretz at the time of the war. And I thought, okay, the war, let's go back. You mean the Six-Day War? And I think he said, no, World War I or something. Or, <laughs> or two, one, one of the, you know, so, okay, I said, yeah, uh, there's an age difference here. <laughs> yeah, but it was a very special time. And, but I always had in my heart the feeling that um, Eretz Yisrael was my home, really from that year, 1973. And um, so I was in Eretz for a while, in, in Lakewood for a while, and then I came back to Eretz Yisrael. I learned by, uh, I was in the, uh, in the Mir for a little bit, and then I went to Rav David. I was Rav David in Brisk for a year, and then I learned a number of years of Artsy Kushalevsky. That was pretty much my, my learning career. I was in Kodal by him also. Went back to the States for, uh, for a little while to, after my father was Nifter, to, to teach. I was teaching in Miami. Came back to Eretz Yisrael, as was always my dream. I was here for around, uh, at that point, 10 years. Uh, I was a Rebbe in, uh, this goes back a long time, in Or Yerushalayim for a year, sure. in Neve Tzion, actually, oh, wow. for, for, Hardcore. for a year, hardcore <laughs> stuff. And then, um, and then one day I get a knock on my door, and uh, Baruch Chait was at my door saying he wants to open this new yeshiva high school called Marava. Oh, okay. And so I became his first rabbi there. I, really? I started oh, the I yeshiva didn't there. Okay. Yeah, I was there for like 10 years. This is in what, like the 90s? This is probably more like the 80s. 80s, yeah. 80s I imagine, when it was founded. I was with him for, I believe, eight or nine years. How did you know him? I didn't. He found me. He found me. He heard about me. I'd, ne- I'd never met him. I had listened to some of the rabbi's songs. <laughs> Never really was that big a fan, but okay. Um, and I was with him, very special time uh, to be with Rav Chait. And we were, it was there for eight or nine years. And so you were there during uh, probably some of those early controversial years as well when... Sure, we were there for, from the very beginning, from day one. Yeah, so, were, yeah I guess yeah. Uh, ex- uh, excluded from being in Yerushalayim. Is that, I don't know the whole story. Uh, but yeah, that's an interesting story. story. Yeah, um, all these things. yeah, if, if, if you, if you have a couple of minutes, I, I, I would I, love to hear the story just for my own personal, yeah, you know, so voyeuristic purposes. Gr- great story. <laughs> I, before I went to, to uh, go to Marava, so I went to Shlomo Zalman. Uh, we were, uh, my, my wife's family married into the, 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 the Orbach family. So I had I knew him very well. So I went to speak to him and ask him if it's something that I should do. And to teach Lamud Echol, and at that point it was even in Yerushalayim. Marav actually started in Yerushalayim. Right, that's what I was, exactly. Yeah. And uh, so I went to Yerushalayim Azaman, asking him, um, should, I, should I do this or not? Is this something to do? So I said, I know that there's a cherem about teaching Lamud Echol, it's Aser. And Yerushalayim Azaman told me, I remember it like yesterday, he told me that, you know, he says things that are Aser for certain periods of time change. I remember telling me, 
exactly. He said there was a time when if there was a clock in a bass medrash, it would be smashed. There's no such thing as a clock in a bass medrash. That's what he told me. He says, today every bass medrash has a clock. He says, in my day, anybody who would go what they call a chatsi khalifa, you know, a regular jacket. Short jacket. Yeah. Short jacket. He says, unheard of. Right? Cherem, no. He said, it changed. He says, there's no is or there's no such thing. So I told him, I remember this, again, like yesterday, I remember where I was sitting. I told him, yeah, do, do I have to worry about a klala, people will curse me? Mm-hmm. So Shlom Zalman stood up, half stood up, and he looked at me straight in the eye, and he says, davar kazem mekalalim, for a thing like this, you would curse somebody? He said, ze asur, exactly those words. Beautiful. He says, that's what's also. So I said, but people, he said, no, you don't have to worry about such things. He says, it's not. so I told him, I remember, I said, but they said there was a famous story of the son of someone, a family we knew who was cursed, and the son was that. <laughs> so he said, I said, do I have to, he said, ma him yoshvim al pin shel HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when he said, they keep gods, you know. Books. He says, <laughs> en shum bayati kanes bracha. Wow. Story doesn't end there. Okay. okay, so he says, go ahead with it, go ahead and do it. Next morning, I'm at home, and this is all Ben Azman, it was right before I was going to start this man. So we get a phone call, and my wife answers the phone. And uh, so the person on the other end says, Abba Babayit, again. So I had a young voice. So he gives me the phone, who is it? Rav Orbach. Now, I told you we were a little bit, my wife's family married into, married into Rav Orbach from Tveria. Right, Ram Marbach, big tzaddik, that's all. And so I was very close with that side of the family because I, I, my, my in-laws weren't in town, so everything about the, the, the wedding from my wife's side I dealt with. So I thought it was him on the phone. Rav Ram. Rav Ram, So I get on the phone, Rav Ram, Anishma, Ken, Karbezman, Atamatafen, I like, Atamatabere, I like, Mazev, Makara. And then I hear a voice, Lo, Zeha Abba. So Rosh Hashanah actually called me. He called me up, and he says, "Atazo ches shayit etzli etmo." You were by me yesterday. Amarti lecha, rak teida shayu anashim etzli etmo balayla. Again, shomrim shiyeh har beit nagdut. There's going to be a lot of people the against us. Came over. Are you sure? So he says, "Rak rak rak." So I said, "I am." Does that mean I shouldn't do it? He says, "No." No, Rakra Sita or the other. That was know what you're up against. That was a beautiful story of Shlomo Zalman. That's so incredible. So after Marava, I went back to the States. I really felt uh, we have my father was Shalom Alexander Eskros, as you mentioned, yeah. was the legendary mechanic and builder of Tarma Saris, probably the person, mm. one of the two, three people most responsible for the entire day school movement, and probably by extension all of Torah in America. He worked together with Rosh Hagafival. He was in the three people, Rosh Hagafival, and we had three Talmud, and my father, Joe Kamenetsky, and Bernie Goldenberg. Yeah. So those are the three who, who, who made Tarma Sar what it is. And my father dealt with schools more than anything. He also had a Yad, my father, in Chinuch Hatzmai, in Eretz Yisrael, in Iran. There's a, a lot going on in those days, a lot of interesting stories. And so I went back to the States. I was, and I, um, I was there for principal in different schools um, and for 17 years. Oh, wow. So you really and and you're, yeah. where, you're, where, where were your family at that point? Your kids were young still then? The kids were young, yeah. yeah. And, so you uh, really raised your kids over there, actually? Kids, yeah, more or less raised in America. All, all of them also, Baruch Hashem, though, caught the, the, the Israel the bug. bug. They, always, <laughs> they, always knew, they always knew we were coming back. It was right. always, you know, wasn't a question. And uh, around 12, 13 years ago, we decided to come back. I had certain things I wanted to do, uh, really curriculum development, working with things in Chinuch. I could talk a lot about that also, but yeah. you don't have that much time. <laughs> and um, so we came back here, and I was working in schools in Toronto, in the States, in South Africa. I was a curriculum director in all these schools. It was Gan Eden. So you just kind of came in, or you were freelancing, basically. I was freelancing, yeah, yeah. And it was, it was Gan Eden. It was exactly what I wanted to do, building schools, building the Judaic curriculums in schools. It was really fantastic and had a tremendous impact on all the schools. It was, it was something special. And then one day, I always tell this story, a cousin of mine met me on the street and says, do you want to do something great for the Jewish people in Medinat Yisrael? I now learned to say no. Okay? <laughs> I, I didn't know that at the time. So I said, sure, <laughs> what do you need? So he says, someone has to open a Haredi Hezder Yeshiva. And that's where the idea really started. 
said there are many, many Haredi boys, and for all the, the myriad of reasons why it had to happen, there are many Haredi boys who are just wasting their time in yeshivas, and if someone would make a program for that where they could learn and they could maybe earn a degree and they could also do army. I mean, it took uh, two years for the idea to develop and develop until we got to where we are, you know, until we opened, and that goes back around 12 year, 11, 12 years ago. And the idea basically was for many reasons. It was also for the, the idea of there are many Haredi families who, the, you know, as, as we say, you know, the winds of change were blowing. And you could feel that there were many, many Haredi families who wanted something, who wanted to be part of the country, who did, weren't happy with the wall that was being erected between, between the, the Haredi world and the rest of the country. And um, I, I once uh, uh, heard a fantastic line. I always say a wise man said it. And that that's, means I did. Anyhow, <laughs> but it's... Uh, and, and it's very true, and it developed. And, and, but the, the line basically says that the problem with building walls today, I mean to build a wall to keep the outside out, right, is that the bricks are made of glass. Mm. And which means, uh, as we say, tarti mashma. Number one, it means that they're easily breakable. It also means you can see right through. And so you build that wall, but everybody knows what's going on. And so there was, there was so much youth who needed this. I mean, we, we know the amount of guys who are not learning off the dirt, all the stories that go on. And it was needed a, something different, something different, something that was, had a, uh, I would say, a Tsioni bent to it, something, uh, be part of the country, not in the, not in the Dati Lu'umi right, way. Not in the political sense. Not politi- exactly. Right, right. In the identitarian right. sense. 100%, right. And people naturally do not want to be an outsider. They wanted to be part of what was happening. And I think the Haredi world had something incredibly unique and important to, to contribute to the, uh, to the country and to the building of, of the state. And the fact that that really wasn't happening was, was, was a, t- a terrible, uh, terrible injustice to, to, to all the parties involved. And then you add on to it the social aspect of, of the, you know, the divide and, the, the, frankly, the sina, the hatred that takes place and the disconnect that, that serves nobody's interest, and, um, and the, the lack of unity. I mean, basically, I always say, after all is said and done, you could talk about the army, you could talk about getting jobs, you can talk about Parnassah. Really, my game is achtut, is unity. That's really the game. In the end result, to build something where Haredim can, can live a life in which they are, as they do in America, in which they can be invested in the general culture, but yet, on the other hand, no, that I'm, I'm a little different. I always call it setting lines, not building walls. No, there's a line. I don't cross that line. I am different, but I don't have to build a wall. I can be part of what you're doing. And again, the model that we use in America has been very successful in America, where Chavirim can be part of the culture, part of American culture. And, but on the other hand, you're not. You're not, you know, you're, you're, you're Haredi, you're Ben Taira, and a Ben Taira is different. So that to create that in Eretz Yisrael was the was the dream. Now, if you could just give a, a sort of a brief history or overview of what Hezder is in general, obviously it's been a, a concept for right. multiple decades, right. primarily in the Datilumi world. So, right. what was the idea initially, and, and you know, just not in your own program, but right. broadly speaking? So Hezder actually the word means Hezder means an arrangement, That's a Hezder, right? So the arrangement was made all the way back to the beginning of the state, and that was in the Datilumi, as you said, the religious Zionist world, which they felt that the boys at that impressionable of age of 18 to 21 shouldn't just be going to the army. It's a, it's a very, very important time for them to be building up their skills in Torah learning and their commitment to Torah, their commitment to learning. And that wasn't going to happen in, in, on an army base. So to sit there for three years was simply I- impossible. You know, I, uh, just as a, a quick aside, I'll tell you that many, I, I give many times lectures to groups that come from America of non, non-religious people, and they bring me in to speak about the Haredi world, et cetera. And I always start my, my, uh, my talk to them by, by, by telling them, Let, let's first get, rid, let's get the elephant out of the room. Let's, let's, let's deal with that. And I say, you all want to know, why don't, why don't Haredim go to the army? Right? That's the question. Why can't they go to the army? Why can't they go to the regular army? And I said, let me ask you all a question. I said, you're all secular Jews. I said, that's you know, fine. I said, what would you feel like if someone told you that for the good of the country and poor for the country, I want you to take your child 
from 18 to 21. Take them out of university, wherever, wherever they're doing, and send them to Mea Sharm for three years and put them in yeshiva there. It's for the good of the country. It's strong. Okay, would you do it? The obvious answer is not, not a, a million chance. years. Not a chance. <laughs> okay, now you understand. So now just flip the script the other way. Now you understand. But on the other hand, so the Talditilumi world realizes so they needed a Hezder. They needed a different arrangement. And the arrangement pretty much works that instead of three years in the army, the Hezder boys do five years in the army. Our program is also five years. In that five years, approximately half the time is spent in yeshiva and half the time is spent in the army. So they begin, let's say, usually the programs of the first year of, let's say, regular Dati Lumi has their uh, program. The first year they'll be only in yeshiva. Then they'll go together as a group into the army for, let's say, half a year, three quarters of a year, come back to yeshiva for a half a year, and then they go back and forth. And that way they keep, they, they keep first of all, a group together, and they keep, uh, they, the, the uh, I would just say, the environment of the army is less, less important to them because the environment of the yeshiva is something which always anchors them. That's the basic idea. Now, do they, um, they're still part of the general command structure, though, of the army, yes. right? So that, you know, one of, the, one of the contentions is that, you know, you don't want to be subjected to the whims, so to speak, of a, of a non-observant soldier who, mm. or commander who may not understand your sensitivities and things of that nature. Of course, we're not when we're talking about the issues of pikuach nefesh, but we're talking about general day-to-day -day operations, you know, time to daven, all those kinds of things. So how does that work for general has their people, or is it all the commanders are all within the, from within their own ranks? No, no, they go into regular units. Um, the, the brilliance of the program is that they go in, as I said before, as a group. So you're never just one guy who's got to deal with, you know, a commander. And you, have, you have 20 guys or 30, whatever it might be, who are dealing with a lot of them go into shiryon, into armor and tanks, et cetera. Um, so they have a certain, a certain power in numbers. And... In general, a general sense, the commanders in the army, even the non from the are understanding. That doesn't mean there are never issues, but the general sense is it works very, very well. It works very well. They, the people are sensitive, and, and uh, they understand. So what makes a, a Hezder program a Haredi Hezder program, specifically? Okay. So when we started the Haredi Hezder program, we needed a different model. And this took us a long time. This took a long time. We needed a different model because... The, all the Hester units are, are, um, are combat units. They're all crazy, yeah. And one of the things we realized was that to have a Haredi boy go into a regular unit, even if he's going with five or ten other guys, go into a regular unit, which means you, you have a unit where you're sleeping on a base, you're there Shabbatot, you're there everything, it just was not going to work. It was not going to sell. The, the Haredi world is, was not ready for that. And so... We also realized, and not only ourselves, but the army as well, that two things converged, came, to, came together at the same time, was that the army realized that, first of all, you know what, we don't really need the, the um, combat soldier. Although maybe that, that may now be an outmoded uh, contention, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. So what we need more are the tech soldiers. Right. So maybe we can you know, have a meeting of minds here. And we sat a long time with the army, with the people in the army, and they said, you know, you, your need is not to be in the regular combat units. You have a problem with that. It's not going to work for you. Well, actually, that's great for us also because we would really love for you to become one of the places where our next generation of tech soldiers. And cyber. And, everything. and cyber. So instead of, for example, where many cyber soldiers in the Army come to the Army with almost nothing out of high school, and the Army has to train them. The Army says, i got a better idea. You know, and we pay for their training. You train them. And actually, we therefore pay for their training, or their parents do, and you bring them into the army already trained to be so. It was just win-win. Right. So the army was very, and I would also tell you that many, many people in the army, their uh, their interest in having Haredim in the army is not only to have them in the army; it's really also to get them into the workforce. Many people in the army, their vision. I, I've met with many, many uh, officers and and, uh, and the all different levels, and all of them realize that part of the pro part of the issue here is really getting getting these guys to, to get have jobs and have and be part of the uh, to building the economy, and therefore this idea of having them go into tech not only helped the army but it also fulfilled their dream 
of getting these guys into the workforce right. and, and trained having, trained with good jobs and high paying jobs and so it was win 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 it was everybody was interested in this happening so what's the actual structure they they come in right away and they're learning but also doing cyber so what they do by us is they come in and instead of splitting the time like i said in the regular uh, units the regular has there. We have a different program. We have our own has there. We're not part of really the regular has there. The, what's called the Igud Yeshiva has there. We're our own program. In fact, the whole program in the army is called Dera Chaim. So they named it after our Yeshiva. And everyone who's in this program is called Dera Chaim, whether they learn by us or not. And what they do by us is they, we do three years first in Yeshiva. And the Yeshiva day is broken down till around um, 3.30. They learn straight Kodesh, like in any Yeshiva, Iyun, Halacha, Musr, everything is till, but we end at 3.30 without pretty much any break. So they don't get that afternoon break. Then from 3.30 to 4.20 around, they have a 45-minute break. That's the break they have. And then they, they learn uh, for a degree in computer sciences basically from 4.30 to like 10 o'clock at night. Wow, pretty intense. It's a very intense program. And um, boys who come in with the Bagrut, then they can start the, the, the uh, academia right away for three years. The boys who come in from the Yeshiva Katanas, and at this point, around half of the boys are coming from the Yeshiva Katanas now, which is quite a, shocking. Indeed. And uh, they do a year of Mechina uh, Kedam uh, Akademi, and then they start their three years. So they're actually in the Yeshiva for four years. After the three or four years, then they go into the tech units in the army, and also they go in, in groups, not groups of 20 or 30, but groups of three or four, or even larger. They, uh, the, the best ones will end up in, in usually in Modi'in. Shmona Matayim. Shmona Matayim, Shmona Echad. Uh, the best the tech units in Modi'in. Um, and depending how good you are there is how high you are. You, the highest go to a program called Gamma, which is an incredible program, the highest there is in, in, the, in the Army. And then from there on, any, they can be in the Air Force, they can be in the Navy, they can be in Chatal, the Chativa Technologi, Divzra Yabasha of the army, they can be in Tikshuv, communication, they, they, they can be in any one of those programs. We have, we have students literally all over the army, and they're there for at least, they're there for two years. And if they're really good and the army wants them, they can stay longer. If the army wants you to stay longer, Baruch Hashem, all our boys do it. It's worth their while, it's worth sure. the army's while, and it's a beautiful thing to do. And they already have a degree at that point. Maybe at that point, they have a they've degree. They've got the Torah yeah. shown from, from, yeah, from the, your program. Yeah. Now, are they... Um, <clears throat> Are they going to, well, let's ask you this. What is the, I guess, the typical profile of a, of a student coming into these, to this program? Is it kind of your bread and butter mainstream Haredi kid, or is it a lot of kids that are struggling and you know, need, to, you know, need support? Uh, so I, I would say that if I were to take any population, and people will argue me with this and fight with me about this, but I think it's correct, though. If I were to take any group of yeshiva guys, I would say the majority of the guys there aren't really built for long-time learning. And, and when you say long-time learning, do you mean even for a couple of years, or do you mean for the rest of their lives? I mean for the rest of their lives, right. which means they're, they'll do it because culturally they, they sure. know they have to and they enjoy it for a while. But the real guys who are like the Rambam's Lashon of a person who's, who's nafsha chashko betorah, right, who just uh, yep. can't do any, couldn't envision themselves possibly doing anything else with their lives, I would say that's usually around 15 to 20 percent. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's interesting how that was pretty much in Klai. So there are two Shvatim who sat and learned out of, you know, 12, 13, you know, and there was uh, and a bunch of Gemaras also. It's interesting. Hamagen Lecha Shlomo was 200 out of 1,200, same one to six. Very interesting. And then the rest, uh, so I would say most of the guys, not all of them, but same thing, I would say probably around 80 percent of the boys who come to us or boys who say, I'm not really fulfilling myself in learning. And I, was, I, I, I need something else. I need something additional. I want to learn. I want to be in a yeshiva. I want to be in an environment. I want to be putting in four or five hours a day of learning. But I don't see this being my future. And Baruch Hashem, they have an option. You know, and it's, uh, you know, in the States, it's easy. They can go to work. They can go to university. They can do anything. And, and, and no, everybody's fine with an Eretz Yisrael. As you know, it's, it's not so simple. So these are boys who pretty much, and all the families, by the way, we have basically zero families who are against their children coming, right? If I had a student come and said, my parents are dead set against this, other than the fact that who would pay for your tuition, right? But I wouldn't even take him at this point because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a disaster. 
So who's encouraging them to come? Is it their obeying, sitting, sitting down with them and having a, a no. heart to heart? Or are they just feeling this? I mean, yeah. clearly it's countercultural, right? Yes. There's, there's not a, you haven't reached a, that critical mass or that tipping point where Correct. this is the standard for 80% of people in, Correct. you know, Hebron or wherever yeah. you want to say. Correct. So what's, what's, draw, what's driving them? What drives them is, is simply a, a omets lev, a certain amount of courage that they have to realize I'm not, I'm wasting my time. There's too much wasted time here. I don't want to be the guy who gets up at 10.30 in the morning and who comes to Seder for two hours and then takes another three-hour break and then for another hour and then, and then comes to night Seder maybe for a half hour. And, you know, they, they just, they look at it and they see it. And we know it, a lot of it exists. And they say, I want something different. I just need something different. I, I really want my life to be more fulfilled. I think that's the, that really is the guys we get. And so they... Uh, and, and it's challenging. It's very challenging for them. You know, challenge them from yeshiva because, you know, I always say the, the Gemara tells us, so you have to start off with, with an ulterior motive to learning. And then eventually. So the alternative motive in a yeshiva is you want to be the next Rosh Yeshiva, you want to be the best guy in yeshiva. Kavad shiduchim. Kavad shiduchim. By us, none of that applies. There's no low lishma to learn. Right, so the only guys who are learning is because they want to learn. Because you know, we we we, and we lean on them, we give tests and their grades and their things. So there, we create a certain uh, you know, but but it's it is hard, and also you know they're not guys who, you know, you would say a a typical like this who's learning five hours a day and then waste the other ten. It's okay, right? By us, they're not wasting the other ten. The other the other ten hours, they're sitting in a classroom and they're learning. So it's, they're, they're tired, it's hard, it's difficult. And so call out, call out to the guys who go through it, and our success rate is fantastic. So, I mean, again, the typical guy who would be coming, I mean, are they coming from the most mainstream yeshivas? Are they coming from, um, you know, I'm not Israeli, but, you know, Hefer and Ponovich, you know, this place. Well, you, you, usually the, see them, are they? They'll, they'll, come, them? they'll come earlier. They usually come, either they'll come from the yeshiva high schools, straight from 12th grade, from all the yeshiva high schools that there are, or they'll come from... Um, or they'll come from yeshiva ketanas. Pretty rare that they'll spend a year in yeshiva and then come to us. Usually if they spent a year in yeshiva, say if they were successful, they're not leaving. They, they, they won't get out. I always say yeshivas don't have exit signs, right? They're not going to get out. And if they weren't successful there, I many times will not accept them because I, I see they're a shever kli, they're broken already, and, and they're burnt out, and they, they simply won't, you know, they won't last by me. So, uh, and as far as, they come everything, Hasidim, Ashkenazim, Sfaradim, Temanim, anything. It really is, is uh, there's no, no, no mold there at all, no model. So what kind of opposition have you gotten? I mean, talking about Marova, going back all those years, you seem to have yeah. a penchant for uh, <laughs> stepping into these uh, you know, thorny well, uh, kind of situations, which well, is, somebody's got to do it, you know? It's interesting. The, the opposition is across the board. And was, even from the yeshiva high schools, such as you met Marava, where right. they will not send boys to us. Really? No, none because of them. Because they want their boys going to these top yeshiva Right, and... right, every single one of them. In other words, to a certain way, almost all the yeshiva high schools that are out there, with Bagrut and Haredi schools, you know, if you ask an interesting question, how many of their children will land up in these high schools? The answer is very, very, very few. I would say 10%. Maybe. Most of them end up going to regular yeshiva right, Regular yeshiva, like yeah. They, it's it's they, a they, typical thing. that like, You have the same thing in modern Orthodox schools where the are yeah. are always to the right. Correct. And, the and, and so that they basically tell the boys, well, as soon as you finish high school, go to yeshiva and take your bagrut and put it under your socks. Right. You know, and don't, don't use it unless you, you really marry the wrong father-in-law. Right. right. Okay. And no one's paying for you and you need a job. Okay. But... The, vet, the majority of them do not. And there may be a difference between some of the schools who basically sure. not, which is why actually four years ago I opened a, my own high school. Interesting. To, yeah. f- to feed into this program. To feed into the program. Well, to feed them, but also to give boys options, right? To be, give options to the... Then when a boy finishes 12th grade and he's stuck, he's this and that, but tell him, let's sit down and discuss. Uh, many people ask me from your high school, where do you want them to go? I say, I don't accept the question. Depends on the family. It depends on the boy. To say that one size fits all is one of the tragedies of the modern of today's Haredi world. Yeah, and uh, so to fight that, but uh, but t- to your point, to the question of about it, it's interesting as far as you know Pashkevilim and all those sort of things. There's never been any Hitnagdut. There's really? never been. 
I'm not really sure why. Went under the radar somehow. Right? I'm, I'm not sure, and, and I'm afraid of the Pashkevillim because I know they'll spell my name Carmi with a kuf instead of a chaf, and oh, that, would, oh, that oh. would really bug me. Um, but there's, not, there's really not been any, any opposition to it. For many years, we flew under the radar. We were, you know, we was word of mouth. How large is the program, okay. by the way? Or was it? We're, we're was now, it? Baruch Hashem, we have around 90 boys in the yeshiva and another like 50 in the army. So we've got 140, 150 now okay. in, the, in the whole And program. while they're in the army, by the way, are they coming back all the time? And they can, because when our, uh, I didn't mention when our boys go to the army, they work in the army. It's a work environment, so right. to speak. So they're there from nine, eight, nine in the morning till five, six at night, and then they're finished. And we, uh, the original problem was boys even to come back to the issue at night, um, and boys sometimes did it. It's it's become a little bit unrealistic from where we are. The geographically, uh, geographically it hasn't yeah. really worked out. What about Shabbos? Things like that. Boys come all the time. We're yeah. having a Shabbat this week. There's not a Shabbat in yeshiva. Where we don't have Bogrim who come and spend Shabbos in yeshiva. Beautiful. Even married guys will come back. With, yeah. with, with their wives, families, you know, it's a, it is beautiful. But it's a family. It's really a family, and, it's, uh, and that's a very important aspect of it because the boys, you know, sort of lost their, their easy connection to the yeshivish world. They yeah. don't really see themselves as part of the yeshivish world anymore because the yeshivish world rejects them, so they don't really see themselves there. So you, you have to replace that, and we replaced it with our own sort of mishpachar, on sort of family and community of Derech Hayim. Yeah, how does this impact their, their sense of identity? Uh, you know, where do they sort of self-identify moving forward? Where do they send their own kids to school? And their, what neighborhoods do they move into? What kind of girls are they marrying in terms of their aspirations? So it, it's interesting. They're marrying this type of, of community, which is growing in Eretz Yisrael, of the, what they call the Haredi HaOved. Right? And it is growing, and there are more and more uh, people who believe in it, and and there are many families. I get calls all the time. You have parents who are with of girls who are looking for uh, this. Are looking for this. I want someone who's not going to tell my daughter to go to work, but they will go to work. Then I want a ben Torah. I want someone who's kaveh eat him. But on the other hand, I want a guy who's working. They, so people want this, and there there are communities. Uh, certainly in Beit Shemesh, there are enough schools to go to, and they're right. finding schools. But that's with the Anglo's more. Yeah, with the Anglo's, and but even in Israel, in Petah Tikva, there are communities you find people who want this. And so, is it totally this? No, but it's not. And as, are they sending their children to a regular cheder somewhere, where they no? So they're they're finding schools uh, wherever they live, and uh, Baruch Hashem, they're marrying girls who want this sort of thing. But they're still self-identifying as Haredi on some level, in some yes, way. Yes, they still wear black kippot, right. and they're still, you know, they, they feel more comfortable culturally in the, in the Haredi world. They don't, uh, culturally, don't really fit into the Dati Lumi world. Right. Like someone once asked me, what's the difference between you and the Dati Lumi? Your hashkafot seem to be almost exactly the same. And my answer was socks. <laughs> you know, that's... Uh, the, socks but, and sandals. Uh, socks and sandals. It's, it's, it's a cultural difference. It's not yeah. really a hashkafic difference. Hashkafically, yeah. hashkafically, anyhow, the world's, the, 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 you know, the very from Datilumi and the Haredi. The Kardali, for sure. Kardali, certainly, yeah. there's, the difference between them is dress. Yeah. It really is, uh, is yeah. dress is the difference. So I think our boys have all found, have found very comfortable niches. They, uh, Baruch Hashem, the Chidushim, they find. Chidushim, excuse me. Chidushim are found easily. And um, and they find Baruch Hashem great families, and we're, we're we're incredibly proud of them, incredibly proud. The vast majority of our guys, even after the army, stay stay from, and they still you know they they're, they're they're good guys, and they're bringing up good families, more Balabatish than yeshivish. But that that's what we're doing. We're building up a, a generation of Balabatim. And are you getting in terms of the opposition? Are, are, so uh, uh, there's no Pashkevilim, but are people, you know, do people call you? Do people protest? Do do Rabbonim, you know, kind of that whole. No. Whisper network? No, I've never, I've never received a, a word. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah. It could be because I'm American, so they figured I'll start with <laughs> Americans, right? <laughs> he's he's, okay. does, he's out of it anyway. Yeah, you know? that, exactly. Or they, or they heard Gross is very stubborn. You better not start with him. I don't know which, <laughs> which way. But no, never. No, what they say behind my back, you know? Yeah, thank God I don't have to care about that. Yeah, it sounds like though. Also, you're not really dealing with. I don't, I don't try to say this sensitively, but kind of like kids who need that rehabilitative environment or that sort of dropout right. kind of environment. You're, you're talking with kids that really were pretty strong and yeah. pretty stable, maybe not, you know, the, sh- the tip of the, you know, the top of the, the yeshivas mm-hmm. that they were in, right. but solid good boys not where there's not familial opposition, there's not the estrangement, whereas right. other, I think there's other miskarot within this sort of, right. you know, um, arena whereby that is more the case. They're, they're kind right. of becoming a surrogate family 
and you know the family is right. estranged and all those sorts of yeah. things. Is that where I don't think the Haredi world sees us as a threat um, because we don't go head to head with them. We're not going and pulling boys out of yeshivas, and I think it, at a certain point. Um, many Rosh Hashivas, the vast majority of the boys coming to us, the Rosh Hashivas know it's the best thing for them. They know these guys aren't going to be the next Gedolim. They're not the guys who are, you know, who are, who are sitting stark and learning the whole time. We, we get some of those, but like I said, 15, 20%. But 80% of the boys are guys, yeah, any Rosh Hashiva who cares anything about the boys realizes this is really the best thing for them. Yeah. And by the way, most Gedolim they go to who speak to and ask the questions, they tell them the same thing. They'll say publicly, I can't right. say this. Of course, don't use my name. <laughs> right, but, but, but uh, one of the big Gedolim who I spoke to told me, yeah, I'm 100% for it, do it, this is fantastic. But the same thing, don't use my name. And when I asked him, why can't I use your name? He said, because the only reason you want to use my, my name is because people consider me a God of Israel. So the second you know, uh, you, you start using my name, they'll just make me ice guddle. Right, so it's that's not what happens. It's sort of the, the, uh, yeah. fine, the circular logic. It's not going to help you, yeah. So, um, do you have a rabbinic advisory committee? Is it, and it, are they people that are squarely in the Haredi world, or is that you know the same issue? Like once they do that, then they're no longer part of it, and to have, right. quote-unquote, open Haredim or non-Haredim doesn't help you anyway. So kind of Correct. The, no, we do it. Everything is done quietly. It's done by Chachma. There's no reason. We're, we're not out to change the Haredi world. And I think they understand that. I'm not at, I'm not saying that this is where every Haredi kid should be and we should empty the yeshivas and everybody should go and be learning. It's not, I don't believe that. I believe that what the Haredi world and the Olam yeshivas offers the world is something irreplaceable and it shouldn't be touched. I mean, that's, that's, where, that's where I grew up. My contention is that for the boys who everyone knows, you know, are not going to be those... And they all say, oh, how do you know? You never know. And the, the, the Tziv and this story. Right. <laughs> the answer is always is no, no, I know. <laughs> I know, right? And you know, okay? And, and, and I think the, the, the Gedolim, and I know Rav Shteyman was for it. Yeah. And he never, I never spoke to him, but I know he, he, he was against coming out again. And he said, for the right boy who this is good for, this is... This is this right, is the fantastic. question always is, what does the right boy mean? Meaning, are they talking about... <clears throat> I hate to use these words, these terms, the bottom, quote unquote, mm-hmm. 20%, or are they talking about the quote unquote bottom 80%, right? And that's a huge difference between, right. you know, no, everyone I think agrees that that 15% or whatever it might be, that they're going to be superstars, go own them, whatever, fine. Yeah. But, and everyone agrees, I think also that this, you know, again, these Shabab Nakim or people sitting outside smoking. The question is these people that are fine, they're learning, whatever, that's yeah. where do people come out on that is really the issue. And it sounds like, you are promoting them to be in this kind of a program, or, correct? And and others might still say, eh, keep them, keep them yeah. scared. And, and you know, and in that mid eighty percent, you can there's a divide there also. Sure. So, so I would say the bottom twenty percent says Shavat Nakim, they won't make it by us. So that we wouldn't accept right. them. And, and that, they're, they're, make they're going to other places. Right. And there are programs for them, yeah. Baruch Hashem. So we are talking about guys who are more in the you know it's middle sixty sixty five percent. Middle sixty sixty percent. And I, I think when they go to people who know the family and they go to their Rabbanim, you know, and they, and they tell the Rabbanim exactly the same thing. They tell me, I just feel I've done this now. I've been in Yeshiva Katana for three years, right? And I see already, I just, I'm not there. Right. I'm not right. in that where I'm going to spend the, you know, the 12 hours a day, which we really need to make this work. It's, I'm, I can't, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's not where I'm at. And I want something Shemish Alev. Yeah. And... With with you know with very few I'm sure there are exceptions but they're up they're rabbanim who are all Haredi rabbanim and they're gedolim tell them do it go for it. Is there a possibility of diversifying in terms of units? I mean, at a certain point, you're talking about a lot of you know potentially a lot of people that could mm-hmm. theoretically benefit from something like this. Not all of them are set up for computers, you know, per right. se specifically. So, what about a guy who wants to be crazy? He wants to go to combat, or he wants to do uh, I don't know human intelligence or something else, right? So th- there are, when they get to the army, so the boys, for example, we had some boys who do do Kravi, who are in Chetz, which is at San Hanim Haredi, or in Tomer, which is the Givati Haredi, but very few, very, very few. Those are usually boys who just can't handle the, the day, can't handle yeah. the program. Um, they, they need to diversify and find other things. It's something that we think about all the time, because like you say, not everybody's built for it. If you can do the computers, it's Ghanaian because that way they go into a group in the army. And, it's a perfect and, uh, solution. It's a perfect right, solution. It's, it's, and when they come out of the kind army, of personality. Certain, right, right. Uh, I've been actually surprised. Uh, I even say shocked by the number of guys who come in and who do it. Even the ADHD types and the kind yeah, of like yeah, the, yeah, and the, the, the schmoozing yeah. types. And they have no idea the computers are good for them. These guys come from Yeshiva Katanas. How would they know? You know, they think computers means you know how to you know. 
you know, you know how to write in Word, you know, they, they don't have any idea. And yet, our success rate with students passing is probably over 80, 90 percent. And the, the general Haredi success rate in academia is around 30 or 40 percent. Right. Most of them fail for obvious reasons. Right, sure, they're just right? coming in that alone. And, alone, and, and right, and too old, and families. Yeah. Is, but our success rate, I, I would say, is closer to 90%, or even higher. And uh, how that works, I, I don't even know. I tell you the truth, it's one of my pleasant surprises that almost everyone passes, and they do very, very well in it. And they go into the Army, they get great jobs, and they're, and they're thrilled. Uh, almost every single boy has been so happy in the Army. The Army experience has been fantastic for them. And they've been much beyond others. We just had a student now. Later, I'll show you the video clip of a boy. Okay, not run of the mill. He's a great boy. But a boy who went to Gamma, the highest level in Shemana Matayim. So he's in the highest, highest level of the, of the computers. You know, when he comes out of the Army, he'll be earning like yeah. 30, 40,000 a month. Yep. Not like you and me, right? <laughs> okay. And, um, and he just went, not only that, he went to officer's course in Shemana, in Gamma, in this, the yeah. highest level. And so he finishes officer's course, and at the end of officer's course, you see all the soldiers around him. He's making see him on shots. Unbelievable. Okay, so not everybody does this. Sure. Okay, but the the kid Shem shemaim that's happening through our boys is incredible. In fact, the pit gam of our yeshiva on our on our stationery, so to speak, is shiye shem shemaim mitahev al yadecha. Beautiful. That is the end game. The end game of unity, what I spoke about, yeah. is that people see our soldiers and say exactly what the Gemara says. They love HaKadosh Baruch Hu, they love Torah, they'll, they'll love the Olam HaTorah. They say, that's what Olam HaTorah is, not what we've heard or we've seen the extremists. But here you have Olam HaTorah, a person who is from, and who has the, you know, the, all, all the Arachim, all the values of, of a Ben Torah, of a Haredi person. And yet they're here, they're with us, and they're normal, and they're working, and then the army, and they're doing, and they're, not only that, they're great, they're really good at what they do, and they do it believe in Nefesh. There's a reason the army loves our guys. I mean, yeah. the, the competition for our guys is hilarious. They're literally units in the army who compete to get our guys in there. Why not? You're getting a 21-year-old with a degree, with his head, head screwed on straight. Yeah, focused. You know, and focused, and, and a good boy, and with values. They, 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 they fight for our guys. It's, yeah. it's really, it's fantastic. You know, instead of, you know, usually the army tells the boy, here you're going. You don't, it right. doesn't work that way with us. No, we say, no, we want this boy there and we right. want him there. And by and large, the army is all too happy to, to you know, to Accommodate. comply. Yeah. yeah. Just in the last couple of minutes we have left, I want to, yeah. uh, I would be remiss, of course, if we didn't speak about October 7th and the, the impact on, on your Chavra and, uh, and you know, both those currently in the yeshiva, in the program, and of course those who are in the army. Right. And uh, in particular, we know that you know uh, intelligence was much maligned in, in, yeah. in this uh, situation and um, was also very much compromised given uh, the way the Hamas attacked mm -hmm. and uh, sort of you know eliminated the eyes and ears of the country uh, right right away at the, the beginning of the attack. Yeah. What's kind of been the just the connection and the relationship between your whole program and all of your your people and October 7th? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a very, very interesting question. The, um, I, I would say what's interesting that I found is that the boys, even though many of them just came to Yeshiva, which means they're not really in the army yet, you know, they're, they're mit chayel after a short while, but they're not really in Madim or anything, but they felt a, a very, very close affinity to the army, and they feel shehem bifnim. They feel that they're part of it. So the, um, you know, there, there's not, it's, it's an interesting dynamic because the people in the army don't feel they have to do something special to, you know, to identify with this. They, we're They're there. doing it. <laughs> we're doing it. And it, it, we can tell them, so, well, you're not really doing it yet. You know, you're just learning. But they don't feel that way. They already feel that we're, that's where we are. And, um, you know, in the yeshiva, we say, uh, you know, we, we say a, a bracha letzal every day. Right, right? it's not just generic right. tehillim. It's not generic tehillim, we say the bracha letzal, you know, and it's, uh, a, you know, and we're able to do that. You know, interesting, I was, I was at a wedding, a Haredi wedding, the other night, it was, and it was beautiful, because under the chuppah, the rav there said, you know, let's say parakat tehillim for, who are you saying parakat tehillim for? Le'elu she mosrim et nafsham. right. Can't you just, just say, say the word? Shal. No. It becomes a no. game. Yeah. It's a, a game. 
And so uh, our students aren't there. So, so it's very interesting. I found it interesting that they didn't feel like, you know, I tell them, don't you guys want to go out and maybe go to, so, ma, nachnu, nachnu sham, we're, we're there. That's, that's who we are. We're part of the, the war effort. You know, it's, uh, I found that fascinating. So, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, the Tehillim, and the Fat Islam, I say, we say, have in Rakeno still every day. Wow. You know, be really feeling, because they feel, and, and no student belittles it, no student, it, it's Hem Sham. Yeah. And then this is their identity. Their identity is they are, you know, what I call more this Haredi Tzioni type of a person. Haredi Lumi, there may be. A Lumi is different, because like I said, <laughs> p- politically. It's political. That, it's, it's political. So yeah, they're not there, but, but they're guys who, you know, uh, that's who we are. That's who they are. It's, it's a different, it's a new Haredi. Fascinating. You can uh, really spend uh, hours more learning about this, and I, I, I would love to come visit it. It sounds incredible. Uh, anytime. Where's the Shiva located? Where's the, uh... We're now in Ganyavna. In Ganyavna, okay, beautiful. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Rabbi Karmi Gro is the founder of Derechaim, which is I've known as the Haredi Hezder. Um, incredible, incredible work, and uh, looking forward to watching it continue to blossom. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very, very much for your time. <laughs>